Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Loki Season 2, Episode 2. All the Marvel Easter eggs, interesting filmmaking choices, complex timeline logic, and clues for where this season seems to be going. I got you covered, folks. And huge thanks to everyone who spent part of their past week with us by watching our Episode 1 breakdown, our reaction, any other video we released this week about Loki. It's just this show, its themes, and the corner of the MCU it is establishing just means so much to me, and I'm just grateful to be able to share my observations with with you. Okay, after an updated Marvel Studios title card, that reminder includes he remains from the season one finale as the Citadel elevator doors open into his office and added Miss Minutes stalling with those fake records with Sylvie and Renslayer in season one, episode five. Episode two opens in London, 1977, which the lower third title confirms is the sacred timeline. A contrast for the episode one post credit scene that clarified that Sylvie in Broxton, Oklahoma is a branched timeline. So here we are looking at a part of history as the TVA planned it. In normal MCU history, there is always been an actor in the 70s named Brad Wolf in a movie called Zaniac starring him. In the opening shot on the left is a London newsstand with the Daily Inquirer spelled with an E not an I like the British tabloid. The Inquirer sign on the far left prints a headline dreams what do yours say about you? We are seeing X5 live out his dream life here on the sacred timeline and for him his dreams tell him that he is a narcissistic prick. All of our characters this episode are tempted to live out their dreams or roll up their sleeves and do the dirty work to keep the universe from imploding. Now, if you're feeling a bit of whiplash in this opening scene with Mobius and Loki already wearing 70s movie premiere tuxedo costumes, yeah, this all happens pretty fast. They were just looking for Sylvie and X5's temp pad going offline as their best lead since Docs and X5 were pursuing Sylvie. But it still feels like a scene is missing that, you know, maybe would have shown Mobius and Loki finding this date on the sacred timeline from the TVA chrono monitor bay and then deciding to go there. But there is no scene like that. And they said that there was no scenes that were reshot for this season of Loki, but you know, maybe there should have been in this case. But if you watch the scene closely, a line was added with Owen Wilson dubbing in some exposition in the post-production step. But you said you wanted to find Sylvie, right? With Docs and X5 not responding, this is our only lead. There are some fun Easter eggs on the posters here. First is a poster for the 1974 Herbie Rides Again, a sequel to the 70s Disney franchise. And all of the descriptions of Herbie in this poster apply to Loki in this sequel season. He's daring, he's playful, he's romantic, he's athletic, and he's defiant. Loki Rides Again. Next is an amazing Easter egg, a Bollywood movie poster for a movie starring Kingo, Kamel Nanjiani's Eternal from Eternals, who does what Brad Wolf is now doing, living a dream life as a movie star. This poster was actually on Kingo's private jet on the far left in the Eternals film. The movie is Saroush K. Putra, or in English, Son of Sarosh. We also saw Kingo posters in Hollywood in the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. And then on a sign for this Leopold theater, it boasts a new and improved cinema snack bar with hot popcorn, orange juice cartons, and ice cream. And then at the bottom, tea and snacks offered at intermission. Beneath that is a fully ridiculous poster for a fictional movie called Phone Ranger. Perhaps a play on the Lone Ranger with the tagline, Criminals, he's got your number. Starring Charles Theobald, Rick Dune, Lorenzo McIver, and Victor D. Eli Wood. Produced by Goodman Productions, which is the same company and production team that made Zaniac. The Phone Ranger's head is a red phone, and his chest emblem is a phone keypad. His sidekick uses a corded phone as a weapon. I guess you could draw some TVA connections here, like the mystery ringing phone of episode one, and the idea of anthropomorphizing a face into a phone instead of a clock, like Miss Minutes does. But this premiere is for a horror movie movie called Zaniac, which according to the marquee stars Brad Wolf and George Ethan Walker, Stephen Allen, and Leah M. Jensen. It looks like the artist of this poster used Raphael Casal's likeness to render this monster. But Zaniac is actually a detail for Marvel Comics. A Thor villain from Thor 319 in 1982 introduced as a swarm of demonic creatures from the dark dimension that possess a host and gives them a bloodlust and a desire to kill women, which it does for the actor Brad Wolf while he is shooting a slasher film at the University of Chicago in the same site where they conducted the test for the Manhattan Project. Watch Oppenheimer goes into that. And while he was dressed in a costume as this goofy movie villain, whose name was a Zaniac, he gets possessed by the swarm and caught in a radioactive blast. You know, University of Chicago students don't go into the football field. But years later in Marvel Comics, Zaniac returns in 1986's Thor 371-372 when Thor teams up with TVA agent Justice Peace to prevent the Zaniac from starting a world war. So I think that's really the reference point here with Loki teaming up with the TVA to intervene with Brad Wolf as Brad Wolf is living out to the timeline 
timeline as he was supposed to live it. I guess we should assume that X5 pruned his sacred timeline self and took his place, maybe doing this months ago to allow himself to grow out this haircut. Now, I've compared this season of Loki to The Matrix, and X5 is absolutely an analog for Cypher, Joe Pantoliano's character, who betrays the other humans in a deal with the agents to plug himself back into the simulation and specifically makes this request. I don't want to be rich. You know, someone important. Like an actor. So in the theater lobby, we hear a disco rendition of Natalie Holt's Loki theme music. A reporter asks Brad, Are the Bridget Bardot rumors true? Bridget Bardot was a French actress and sex symbol in the 50s through the 70s, but she withdrew from the spotlight in 1973. So this would be Brad Wolf kind of canoodling with her to bring her back out of retirement. Mobius asks if there will be a Zaniac 2. And I just love this gag of having more famous actors pretending to be the less famous face at a public event. My favorite example of this gag being Steven Soderbergh's shot in Ocean's Eleven as Topher Grace and Joshua Jackson came out of the nightclub and got mobbed by fans while George Clooney and Brad Pitt walked by all these people unnoticed and given some like annoyed side eye by some of those fans. I love food. A good meal is a movie for your mouth, but I particularly love it when it's delicious and delivered straight to me. And that's what Cook Unity is all about. You know, mouth movies. Cook Unity is the first chef to consumer platform that delivers freshly prepared pre-selected meals right to your door weekly. Cook Unity is basically a pipeline from your home to a diverse group of talented chefs that cook delicious inventive meals fresh every day in regional micro kitchens, not warehouse production facilities. And the meals they make are so good. There's no artificial ingredients. The meat is humanely raised and Cook Unity chefs use organic ingredients whenever possible. There's meals for everyone, including options for vegan, paleo, gluten-free diets, all covering a wide range of cuisines. You could be eating Ruben Garcia's crispy tilapia one night, classic Italian meatballs from chef Dustin Taylor the next night, and then kickstart your weekend with bulgogi bibimbap from Chef Esther Choi. And you gotta see my first Cook Unity meal. So this week we got shrimp and smoked and dewy sausage jambalaya. Jambalaya. Mm. Oh, How this is, is it? Really good. Mwah, so good. All the meals are delivered fully cooked, so all you have to do is heat them up. No more cleanup, no more meal planning. All you have to do is set up your weekly subscription. If you want to pause, skip a week, or cancel, it's super easy to do. So go to cookunity.com slash nrockstars50 or click the link in the description below and use my code nrockstars50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourself. So Brad scampers out of the side door and tries to use his modified temp pad, but B15 intercepts. Oh my God, it's Brad Wolf. Can I get your autograph? Anything for a fact? B15 uses a young, dopey American girl accent here in London. And even though Wunmi Mosaku is a British actress and would be right at home playing an English girl, she uses an American accent here because it's Brad she's trying to woo here. And he would probably be more into an American tourist. B15 wears this TVA orange color. The lights of the alleyway bathe them all in orange. She just looks awesome. But when Brad initially spills out into the street, a few punk rockers are leaning against that back wall in the background. These are the ones that Loki later illusion projects to fool Brad. So this would be the moment that he clocks them and stores them in his mind for later. Loki blasts Brad down some steps. There's a pile of newspapers and matches that would have been convenient for Brad to land on, but no, he lands on cold hard pavement. Now, if you look at the sign, this is Strand Lane. And I actually mapped out this exact spot in the Covent Garden neighborhood of London. And these steps are the Surrey Steps, which is adjacent to an easy to miss London historical curiosity, what was called a Roman bath, according to Victorian Londoners. But this just dates back to the early 17th century. By the way, I am obsessed with the city of London and I actually lived in this neighborhood in summer 2008. It's filled with real world Easter eggs like this. And I am as unsufferable on London walking tours as I am on YouTube. Now they almost get run over by a Miller and Kane classic Range Rover. And then X5 uses what looks like a prisoner time twister to escape. But rather than it being on his neck collar, he wears it on his wrist like a watch. X5 twists right back to that base of the Surrey steps on Strand Lane where Loki knocked him on his ass before. X5 then runs into a gang of punk rockers. But if you look closely, some of them are mods based on those bikes that they're riding. So mods, you remember, are the London gangs that they based the Tatooine gang on. Remember from the Book of Boba Fett and it made everyone really mad? While those mods were around mostly in the 50s and 60s, there was a mod revival period in the late 70s. So it would make sense that they're here. Now behind them on the street is a pub called The Hat and Tun, which is in a different part of London than Covent Garden. This is on Hatton Wall and Hatton Place, thus The Hat and Tun. Loki reveals himself as an illusion projection and swipes the twister off X5's wrist. <laughs> You quit with the magic and fight fair! Oh, 
pushing. Yeah, I like the camera trick they do by cutting away from Loki in close up back to X5 yelling at him. And in that reverse shot of X5, they already have Tom Hiddleston standing in the background from the beginning of that shot. So Loki's duplicates close in on X5 as he backs toward a wall with less is enough written on it, which is ironic because Loki is totally using some overkill here. Meanwhile, on the wall behind Loki is graffiti reading piss off. So it's kind of like their backdrops are shouting at each other. Less is enough. I'll piss off. Loki's horned shadows grab X5. And I know I bring it up 1990s ghost a lot because I just watched it. It's like one of my favorite movies, but this is a lot like when the demon shadows come to life and grab the dam to drag them off to hell. And to make that sound effect, they use the sounds of babies crying and it's stretched out, lowered it and makes it sound so creepy. So Loki asks, a little over the top, don't you think all the shadow play? I thought it was spot on. Yeah, we all assume Loki is middle projection, but he's actually on the right. He's never where you think he'll be. So D90 and B15 escort X5 through the TVA and they pass this poster that instructs, when prompted, take deep breaths. And in the bottom left corner, it reads, enhance conversations with variants. So it's interesting advice for these TVA interrogators as the center section of this episode explores Mobius and Loki's interrogation tactics on X5, tactics that he, as a TVA hunter, would know how to resist and counteract, including an ability and an inability we'll see inside that time cube to take deep breaths. Mobius and Loki approach OB in the RNA, and he mutters to himself, I've got to weave these two arms together, and I've got to make this knee even tight. Huh. So it holds. Yes, weaving cords together tightly is also physically what the temporal loom is supposed to do with timelines. Now, behind his desk, you can see a popcorn bucket. So, popcorn, was he at that Leopold Theater Zaniac premiere? Also, there's a box labeled Mullard, which is a British electronics parts manufacturer that was founded in the early 20th century. OB offers to look into X5's temp pad, but he asks, Do you think this is a higher priority than preventing a temporal meltdown? I love Kihuei Kwan's delivery here, because while this line could be read, as sarcastically, there is not a hint of attitude in his voice. Instead, he just flips them his TVA handbook. And notice every time we see him handle it, he flips it elegantly. In fact, I didn't fully appreciate enough the smooth over-the-shoulder toss and grab from Kiyui Kwan to Tom Hiddleston while they were in motion and perfectly hitting all their complex dialogue in that long take last episode. Never forget that Kiwi Kwan is great at physical acting and stunts. In fact, he worked on the stunt crew of the 2000 X-Men film. We have not seen his full form on this series yet. He is going to fight at some point this season. In fact, I really do get the sense that Kiwi Kwan is kind of an angelic entity. The original he remains, the OG, like Morgan Freeman and Bruce Almighty, and that Obi here is just kind of tossing them a hotel nightstand Bible and hinting, all the answers are right here if you were to just open this book. B15 checks in with Casey, who speaks softly, thinking that the Renslayer trace is a secret. I like this because every time Owen Wilson talks on the series, he's like practically whispering. But B15 correctly points out that now that they're in this existential crisis mode, there's no point in information siloing. She reminds us that Renslayer killed C20, referring to that poor hunter from season one who was kidnapped by Sylvie and gave up the information on the timekeeper's location in the TVA. Just a reminder that there is a difference in the TVA between pruning, which banishes one to the void, and directly killing, which would eradicate one from existence akin to spaghettification. Casey says, With Miss Minutes down, the analysts are running traces manually. Yeah, we are seeing how reliant the TVA was on Miss Minutes. She wasn't like a Microsoft Office paperclip friend, but kind of an extension of he who remains, ruling unilaterally on which variants and which branch timelines to make a move on. Mobius and Loki try to unscrew X5's temp pad themselves. No, 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 section 42 should match with the system. Wait, is that with the red light? Because we tried that already. We'll try it again. Ah, uh, the number 42. Because media literacy is dead and everything equals everything. Everyone thinks every mention of the number 42 is a reference to the answer to the great question in Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide or Miles Morales' Spider's Universe number or Jackie Robinson's number or a number that shows up in Everything Everywhere All at Once, also starring Kiwi Kwan or the number of the rounds on Ripley's Pulse Rival and Aliens as she was going down the elevator. Sometimes it's just a high enough double digit number that screenwriters like to use, kind of like the recurring number 17 in the MCU and 12 often used as a highest single syllable number. And really, I just think they chose the number 42 because it's pretty amusing that a temp pad would have at least 42 sections to it. Casey reports that Miss Minutes is helping Renslayer and Loki relays that audio recording that he heard in the past that Renslayer and He Remains were partners. So we're getting a sense of a love triangle at the heart of the season. He Remains spurning Renslayer for some reason and He Remains other side piece Miss Minutes as a fellow spurned ex with his two girlfriends joining forces like two ghosts of girlfriend's past. A theory that we've been chewing on is that Miss Minutes may be part of Renslayer's mind or memory 
memory or soul or consciousness that was extracted from her body and contained in a separate animated shell, like the second half of Renslayer's Bicameral Mind. In Tuesday's video, we talked about the possibility that Renslayer could have been Kang's female variant the way Sylvie was Loki's variant. So if slash when Renslayer and Miss Minutes unite and share notes, they could amount to a full Kang variant of equal threat or even greater threat than he remains. B-15 says about Miss Minutes, She really is full of surprises. Yeah, it kind of sounds like she was about to say she really is annoying. The glass panel of Mobius's cubicle has words he's written, station detail cards, time detail cards, error details, and then some graph with a stair step increase there. But on the x-axis, of course, is time. So they interrogate X5. And you'll notice this room is all orange. Orange is often considered the most irritating color visually for interior design, at least when it's in an overwhelming amount. Loki tells X5 that there are lives at stake, which X5 throws back in his face. You're just trying to make up for all the terrible, awful shit you've done in your life, you pathetic little man. Just a reminder that L-130 is not the Loki who went through Thor the Dark World or Ragnarok or Infinity War, but rather this one. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. But since Loki has already made peace with that life, he lets X-5 go on. See, everything you and Sylvie have ever done to try to help, has only ever made it worse. Ooh, X5 going after Sylvie pisses Loki off because Loki knows that this Sylvie from a young age was really a victim of the TVA. So he's ready to tell X5 to keep his girl's name out his mouth. X5 notices that Loki's trigger is when he brings up the women in his life. So he does it again. You just make everything worse for Mobius, for B15, for your mother. Ooh, not. Frigga, don't talk about guys' moms. X5 calls Loki a loser and a villain, and Loki embraces being a loser, calling back he and Sylvie's conversation in season one, episode four. Do you think that what makes a Loki a Loki is the fact that we're destined to lose? Mobius eases the tension with a knock-knock joke. <sighs> Who's there? Brad. Brad who? That's Shulpis. I think the funniest thing about it is just that little laugh that Owen Wilson gives afterwards. But Mobius is thinking that he can catch more flies with honey, but that backfires as X5 gets under his skin, questioning who Mobius was back on the sacred timeline, who he left behind, making me wonder if Mobius might have had a co-pilot while he was riding that jet ski. And instead, Mobius gives X5 the Mr. Jada Pinkett Smith treatment. Open-handed! Nowhere, man. You're a girl. You're a no Ah, in there, you heard them calling each other a nowhere man, which is an interesting term now that we got the cosmic MCU and the idea of someone being a nowhere man with a K, meaning a refugee who would find himself starting over inside of a skull. Afterwards, Mobius says, Nope, he didn't get under my skin. He got under your skin. Yeah, suddenly Mobius tracing the word skin in the dust bears some new meaning. So they make it to the Automat, a green room with only one entrance at the end of this remote hallway that kind of looks like it's just past the RNA. No one else is in here, but there is a whole wall full of cases of slices of key lime pie, which I must say is normally not this shade of green. The walls of this automat contain this poster that reads, one slice per week. Bartering for extra tokens is forbidden. 17 minutes is sufficient. Tokens? Have the TVA employees been getting weekly tokens and had no idea what they were for? Or are these just tokens for any food that they could purchase at the cafeteria and didn't know that they could also be used here at the automat? And yeah, there's that number 17 coming back. And sure, since we did this for 42, let's play this game with 17. So 17 was one of the Winter Soldier activation words. 17A was the Avengers compound storage unit that contained Iron Spider armor. Also Infinity War, T'Challa ordered to open Northwest Section 17. Is there any significance? Or is the MCU just an Overwatch franchise with dozens of films and commonalities are bound to occur? In 17, it's just kind of like another weirdly specific prime number that's simultaneously a lot of something, but also not enough of something. Loki recalls the events of 2012's Avengers. You remember that time? I was so angry with my father and my brother. I went down to Earth and I held the whole of New York City hostage with an alien army. Interesting for Loki to now frame it not as pure ambition, but as bitterness he felt toward Thor and Odin. He goes on. I tried to use the Mind Stone on Tony Stark. It didn't work, so I threw him off the building. I mean, let me say something. Wasn't tactical. Another interesting detail, because this Loki was extracted from the year 2012. And back at that point, he must have known that the scepter contained an infinity stone. That wasn't something any of the Avengers at that time, or the studio, or we knew to be true, at least in 2012. Loki also asks Mobius if he was ever curious about his sacred timeline life in case it was something bad. And Mobius says that he could handle something bad, but he would hate it if it were something good. Which tells us that Loki can only imagine his sacred timeline life as a series of tragedies, losing Frigga, losing 
losing Odin, his own death. He can't imagine a happy life that he would be missing out on because his life in the TVA with Sylvie has been the happiest he's ever been. When Obi first enters the Loom Room, he passes a screen that reads Perpetual Sequencer C, and on that screen, a few links in a chain with a flashing center, which may represent the overwhelmed temporal loom. On a second computer screen, which we see in close up, it reads Interconnector B, Displacement B, and a bunch of VAR, which I assume would stand for variance. And we see that the value for FVAR is null. I don't know what that means, I just wanted to point that out for you. Obi's temporal aura reads as invalid. So someone with the right time soul fingerprint needs to activate this. If Obi said Miss Minutes would keep this running and he only needed to run diagnostics and they need he who remains aura that could fuel my theory that miss minutes is a kind of derivative of a kang variant because she would carry a trace of his aura in sense of color palette this episode i just kind of find it interesting that this episode swings back and forth between alarming orange filling the frame to relaxing sea foam filling the frame scalding our rods and cones with orange and then soothing them with sea foam for round two of x5's interrogation they wheel in this device that we actually saw in the end credits montage and all of these scenes we've seen this vent hose hanging from the wall and now we see that it plugs into this thing that kind of looks like an old school vacuum or shop vac but Loki switches it on and Mobius does a really good job pretending like he doesn't want this to happen to be the good cop that the bad cop locked out of the room uh, Mobius hey get in here yeah there's his tell he calls him Brad through the door not X5 to kind of make himself sound like he's X5's friend that he doesn't want him to get hurt Loki creates a time cube around the stool and then crushes it and then forms one around X5 last episode we saw a poster explaining the time cube atmosphere and now we know what this does and it's horrifying i actually love this textural detail of all the scratches on this plexiglass like surface kind of makes it feel tangible to us the viewer and somewhat creepy as the scratches might have come from people desperately trying to claw out of this or suddenly scratching along the floor as it shrunk in size and now we have some context for why this floor is graded is for when people trapped inside this time cube get crushed down to viscera and that would ooze down to the drain we are are seeing a slaughterhouse killing floor. And yeah, they really must have pressed Raphael Casal's arms against some surface because now we see his elbow skin pressing against it and just apologize to any claustrophobes watching this episode because it must have been torture for them. The Loom Room X-Men doors open again. I brought these up last episode. I don't think this is an intentional Cerebra reference or anything. Trust me, after breaking down movies and TV shows for seven years, X's and Hexes show up everywhere. And we learn how Casey is starstruck to meet OB. Will you sign mine for me? Of course I will. Happy to do it. Yeah, just next to your picture. Yeah, Obi's picture is in the TVA guidebook? I'm telling you, for Miss Minutes or He Remains to allow Ouroboros to retain any public authorship on any literature inside the walls of the TVA means that Obi has some power that they cannot override. Obi might be the OG, the original He Who Remains. Yet, Obi cannot access the Loom Room without He Who Remains aura. So they kind of have these checks and balances on each other. X5 takes them to the McDonald's in Broxton, Oklahoma, 1982, where the sign reads over 40 billion served. In the 1980s, 80s, McDonald's would boast how many billions of burgers they had served, but they officially stopped counting in 1993, so the signage now simply reads over 99 billion served. You can imagine Sylvie seeing this sign and thinking, after watching billions upon billions of people die in apocalyptic events, maybe now I can work for a service that just serves tens of billions of people. Loki finds Sylvie inside, working the register, now having grown a solid 80s mullet. You can also see that she's wearing onk earrings. One detail I missed from episode one that many of you pointed out to me in the comments was that Casey's guided meditation tape was the same recording listened to by Stephen Grant in Moon Knight. Your mind and right. Solving puzzles is a great way to keep your mind awake. So I don't know, maybe there will be further connections between the TVA and the Egyptology of Moon Knight. And we get some more orange versus sea foam color contrast here in the parking lot, Sylvie's orange McDonald's uniform as she sits on the bed of a green Ford Ranger. Loki tells Sylvie that he saw her in his future, but she says that she made sure that the future wouldn't be written. What Sylvie isn't considering is that maybe he remains might have wanted her to kill him, that that could have been part of his original plan. That's Loki's assumption that he remains was telling the truth, that they can't let the TVA go unfixed. He offers even to let her enchant him so that she can see what is in his mind, something he never wanted her to be able to do back on Lamentis. This is a big concession from him. And last time we saw Sylvie enchant something, it was Eliath when she enchanted him to see where the Citadel was at the end of time. And for the second time this episode, Mobius chows down on some pie, this time a McDonald's apple pie to compare it to the key lime pie earlier. And I love how X5 is framed perfectly next to the Hamburglar. Rubble, 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 rubble. One of these wearing old timey prison garb striped uniform, whereas X5 is wearing the TVA prison garb. Both of them, they're just little burglars. Rubble, rubble, rubble. Mobius coaxes X5 
happened to talking about the Zaniac. It's not scary, it's elevated thriller, all right? It it's is. cinema. <laughs> cinema! Marvel must have known this season of Loki would be dropping around the same time as a Martin Scorsese movie, because the last time Marty was in the press circuit, it was 2019 for the Irishman, when he famously pissed off Marvel fans by saying that the MCU wasn't, quote, cinema. But you know what? Marty had the last laugh, because uh, Marvel, apparently, according to The Hollywood Reporter, is on fire right now, and Killers of the Flower Moon is great. But the reason X5 has been so jumpy is that they are currently in a branch timeline, and he knows what General Doc is planning to do to all these branches, which Sylvie and chance out of him. A bombing is a coming. So Sylvie taps something on her hand to make her McDonald's uniform disenchant back into the armor she showed up here wearing after she killed He Remains. Presumably what she tapped is He Remains temp pad, but she must have cloaked it to be invisible on her hand. Back in the TVA chrono monitor bay, the screen shows branches getting bombed and notice they are all numbered with codes beginning with 616. We see branch 616-07K TR-470 bombed, branch 616-011-QY-435, branch 616-13P ER-002, like error, that's bombed, branch 61644U UQ001 and other 616 coded branches in the ticker above. The TVA is apparently using the same universe designation system for the Marvel comics, in which 616 is considered the main Marvel Universe number. Loki also used this in season one when Loki's film strip was labeled ETH 616, and Multiverse of Madness established the MCU as 616, at least from Christine Palmer's perspective from Universe 838. This rightfully drives Marvel Comics readers nuts because the MCU film universe was supposed to be labeled Earth 199999, and the film universe exists exists as a separate universe within the pages of 616 Comics. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse even fired a shot by re-establishing the MCU as Earth-19999. Don't even give me Doctor Strange and the little nerd back on Earth-199999. I did a whole video diving into this debate and I revealed that Kevin Feige actually never said that the MCU was Earth-199999. That myth was made up in a Reddit comment and never fact-checked. This actually came from a 2008 source book from a wholly different division of Marvel from the film studio. So this idea of of labeling all these branches 616 something is Marvel Studios saying that the MCU sacred timeline is 616 and each branch is a subset of 616. But I completely agree with Iman Vellani and every Marvel Comics reader who find this confusing. I always say, if you want to call it 616, put an asterisk next to it that says, not yet. Not until after Secret Wars and we have like X-Men, Fantastic Four, and all the rightful Marvel lineup in the universe. So Mobius, Loki, and Sylvie find General Dock Center Hunters in this remote command center. This shooting location is the historic Chatham Dockyards in Kent in the UK. This was established established in the 16th century following the Reformation and has since built over 500 ships for the Royal Navy until it was closed in 1984. In the background, you can actually see the sign, Deliu and Sonar Bat Bidgeri. Dan Deliu is Marvel's longtime BFX supervisor who directed this episode. Vagland Bat Bidgeri is actually a shipyard in Norway. Dox has rigged up reset charges with temp pads to bomb branch timelines, something that Sylvie recognizes because think about it, this is more or less what she did at the end of episode two of Loki season one, dropping all those reset charges from the Rocks Card Superstore, except her charges cause chaos throughout the timeline. Dox is dropping these bombs to try to clean it all up. But the three of them shut down the operation. Sylvie uses that sword that she used to stab He Who Remains. Loki uses a pruning stick and he chucks it at one hunter from a distance. And then the variants join hands and finish the job. Don't overthink it. Sylvie doesn't want Loki to fall in love with her through this gesture. Yet, notice how they are always more powerful when they are joining hands. Episode two of the first season ended with Sylvie opening a time door and walking through it, trusting Loki to follow her, but coming off as if she didn't care whether or not he did. And that's what Loki does here. He just gives Sylvie one glance and then turns to walk through the door and trusts her to make her own choice on whether or not to follow. And she does. But they all watch in horror at Dox's success. Billions of people being pruned out of existence. The dead timelines turn the color gray, which is the color of the dust that Thanos' victims turned into when they were erased from existence. A visual effect that Dan Deliu actually led the design of. And on that screen at the bottom, it says 802 active, which makes me think that there might still be 802 active branches, which would still be a lot for OB to try to make Manage, but earlier they said that Doc successfully pruned at least 30% of them. So doing some math here, 802 over X equals 70 over 100. That would mean that there were originally a total of 1,146 branches and that at least 343 of them were pruned. 343 different Earths. Now, our Earth's current population is 7.888 billion. So multiply that by 343 of them, that would mean over 2.7 trillion people were just erased from existence by General Doc. But we still see some orange branches still intact, so I assume that would include the branch timeline of Sylvie's McDonald's in Broxton. But this pruning of the haystack has a silver lining. The temporal loom won't be in as much of an immediate crisis, but they also have a clear enough signal to lock onto Renslayer's temp pad. That screen lists the TVA entity as 221 slash A. There's a still intact branch F2, one branch pruned, and then a branch Q2, 
two that flashes. I assume that is the branch that Renslayer is now on. But Sylvie says, The TVA is the problem. It's broken. It's rotten. And she leaves and Loki says, It's harder. To stay. This episode began by asking what our dreams say about us. For Sylvie, her dreams say that it's easier to just chill out and eat a Big Mac than it is to do the hard work and face a life full of consequences. So we end with Sylvie back in that McDonald's parking lot, her hands folded over her stomach, where she hides he remains tempad, the trophy that she has no intention of surrendering. We see some photos in the closing credits that have been updated to include Brad Wolf's actor headshot, also a photo of Casey and B15, Sylvie at the McDonald's, Loki and Mobius in London, and General Dox. Meanwhile, the song playing over the closing credits is Janis Joplin. Cosmic Blues, which features Janis Joplin starting out slow. Time keeps moving on. Friends, they turn away. And then she gets more impassioned and she says, I keep moving on, but I never found out why. And then Janis Joplin just goes into her signature scream and I keep pushing too hard and babe, I keep trying to make it right through another. And then she slows down and says, lonely day. Oh, whoa. Oh. And I love how this music frames Sylvie as an older, wiser woman trying to enjoy her peace and quiet, but then angrily turning on herself as she has hasn't really gotten over anything. Thank you so much for watching this breakdown of Loki episode two. I'm just blown away that so many of you care enough to make these analysis part of your viewing. I appreciate all of you. So please hit up those comments with your thoughts and theories and be sure to check out our reaction to this episode and stay tuned for our sneak peek at episode three coming this Sunday. We're actually gonna mix it up with a new rotating guest every week. You can support us by grabbing some of our exclusive Loki inspired merch designs over at nerdriot.shop. Please subscribe to all three of our channels in the New Rockstars Network. You can follow me at EA Voss and I'll see you next week. Bye everybody.